Good morning. All right, Fudgemania chapters 7 and 8. The best news of the century. Mitzi was smaller than Fudge, with long hair tied in a ponytail. She wore a baseball glove on her left hand. Mrs. A introduced us to her as soon as we got to the house. This is Fudge Feather, she said, and this is his big brother. She put her finger to her mouth and paused. Peter, I said, helping her out. I don't know why people can always remember Fudge's name, but not mine. Yes, Mrs. A said, Peter Feather. Feather is a funny name, Mitzi said. Actually, it's Hatcher, I told her, setting the record straight. But I thought you said your uncle's name is Feather, Mrs. A replied. It is, Fudge told her. His first name is Feather, I explained before things got any more confused. Feather Thatcher. Feather Uncle Feather Thatch Hatcher. Oh, Mrs. A said laughing. I get it now. So you're the Hatcher boys, not the Feather boys. That's right, I told her. I like Feather better, said Mitzi. And Fudge isn't a name. It's a candy. It's a name too, Fudge told her. Right, Pete? That's right, I said. Doesn't he have another name? Mitzi asked. A real name? It's Farley, Fudge said. He stuck out his chin, daring her to say anything more. Farley? Mitzi said, opening her eyes really wide. That's a real name? Yes, Fudge said. Grandma, Mitzi said, is Farley a name? It's a beautiful name, Mrs. A said. There was once a handsome movie star named Farley Granger. She closed her eyes kind of, and kind of sighed. <sighs> then she went into the house to get us a snack. Sheila went with her. As soon as they were gone, Mitzi got shy. She looked at the floor of the porch. Then she looked at the ceiling. She socked her fist into her baseball glove to make a, the pocket deeper, but she didn't say a word. Fudge watched her and hummed a little tune. He didn't have anything to say either. I decided it was up to me to get things going between them, so I said, that's a good looking baseball glove. It's called a Mitzi, she said, hugging it to her chest. Big gave it to me. Who's Big? Fudge asked. My grandpa, Mitzi said. Big Apple. Big who? I asked. Sure, I misunderstood her. Big Apple, she said again. I couldn't believe this. I kneeled beside her and spoke very slowly. Are you telling us your grandfather is Big Atful, the baseball player? Mitzi nodded. I have his baseball card, I said. I know his stats by heart. You want to play in his game? Mitzi asked. His game? I said. She nodded again. We play every Sunday. Are you saying that anyone who wants to play ball with Big Atvil can? You have to pass the over-under test first. What's the over-under test? You have to be over four and under a hundred and four. And that's it? I asked. That's it, she said. Yahoo! I yelled, jumping so high I almost knocked over one of Mrs. A's hanging plants. This is the best news I've heard in a long time. Is it the best news of the century? Fudge asked. It could be, I told him, as I yahooed again. In a minute, all three of us were jumping up and, up and down and yahooing all over the porch. That's when the perfect babysitter appeared, holding a pitcher of juice. I'm gone for five minutes, she said. Five minutes, and look at you, carrying on like a bunch of monkeys. But honey, Fudge said, it's the best news of the century. What's the best news of the century, Sheila asked. Who knows, Fudge said. I don't even know what a century is. I ran all the way home. As soon as I got there, I called Jimmy Fargo. I'm not supposed to make long-distance calls without permission, but this was definitely a special occasion. I was still trying to catch my breath when Jimmy answered. Are you sitting or standing, I asked. Standing. Well, sit down. Okay, he said. I'm sitting. 
Where? I asked. What's the difference? I want to imagine how you look when I tell you the news. I'm sitting on the floor in the kitchen, Jimmy said, with my back against the refrigerator. Okay, I've got the picture. So what's the story, Jimmy asked. You're never going to believe who our neighbor is up here. I paused for a second and took a deep breath. Then I dropped the news. Big Apple. Jimmy didn't say anything. You fainted, right? I said. No. But you're speechless? No. You don't believe me? I believe you, Jimmy said. But I don't get it. Did you say Big Apple is your neighbor or what? I said Big Apple. Boston Red Sox, the greatest center fielder of all time. Ty Cobb was the greatest center fielder of all time, or maybe Willie Mays. I wasn't going to argue with Jimmy. Instead, I explained that there was a chance for us to play ball with one of the greats. I reminded him to bring his glove and his Mets cap to, the, to Maine. Then I waited him for, for him to say something. When he didn't, I asked, Are you still there? I strike out a lot, he finally said. Who doesn't? Probably Big Apple. We're not talking about the major leagues. We're talking about your basic Sunday ball game. Speaking of basics, Jimmy said, how is it going with the Queen of Cooties? Uh, I hardly see her. She's got a job babysitting. What a relief, Jimmy said. I didn't tell her who she was babysitting. I couldn't go to sleep that night. I kept thinking about Jimmy and me playing ball on Big Atville's team. But that reminded me that Jimmy still doesn't know we're sharing a house with the Tubmans. I have to come up with a good excuse and soon, or I'll never hear the end of it from him. I tossed and turned as Fudge babbled in his sleep. I gave him a kick and he rolled over. After a while, I got out of bed and tiptoed down the hall to the bathroom. It was so quiet in the country and dark. In the city, it's never dark. You can always look out your window and see lights. It's never quiet either. You can hear the buzz of traffic even in the middle of the night. I used the toilet, then flushed, and that's when it came to me, the perfect excuse for sharing a house with the Tubmans. I flushed again and imagined myself telling Jimmy the long, sad story. I'd say, see, when we first got to Maine, we moved into this big old house. It had seven bedrooms and four bathrooms, and you could see the ocean from every window. But unfortunately, there was a big problem. What problem? Jimmy would ask. Poison gas, I'd tell him. Poison gas in all the toilets. Green, steamy, gurgling stuff that bubbled up every time we flushed. Blah, Jimmy would say, making a terrible face. Dad had to call the health inspector, I'd continue. She took one look at it and went nuts. This is a disaster, she cried. This is a serious environmental disaster. So then what? Jimmy would ask, biting his nails. She condemned the place. Even though she, even though she was sorry about ruining our vacation, she had no choice. The police came and boarded up the house. They nailed a big sign to the front door that said, Warning! Poison gas in toilets! Flush! At your own risk. Wow, Jimmy would say. You're lucky you got out alive. And I'd say, yeah, I know. A brilliant story, I told myself as I turned out the bathroom light. Jimmy's very big on environmental issues. He's got posters all over his room. Save the whales, save the dolphins, save the rainforest. So he'll understand that the Tubmans were just trying to save our vacation when they let us share their house. I went back to my room and got into bed. This time, I had no trouble falling asleep. Chapter eight, Fudge a Mania. How come you're in such a bad mood? Sheila asked me the next morning. It must be the weather, I grumbled. Actually, it had nothing to do with the weather, which was as gray and damp as usual. It had to do with my brilliant idea from last night. 
Somehow, when I woke up this morning, my poison gas story sounded really weird. I wasn't sure Jimmy would buy it. And where would that leave me? After breakfast, I went back to bed. Dad says falling asleep when your body's not tired is a way of avoiding your problems. Maybe he's right, because when I woke up an hour later, I still didn't know what to do about Jimmy. I looked out the window. The sun was making an effort to break through the clouds. Maybe I shouldn't worry yet, I thought. A lot can happen in a week. The Tubmans might decide they've had enough of Maine. They might be gone by the time J Jimmy gets here. I got out my baseball cards and went down to the porch. I was laying them out alphabetically by player's last name when Mitzi showed up. I still couldn't believe Mitzi's grandfather was Big Atville. I wonder why Mrs. A didn't tell us about him unless she's sick of people falling all over themselves when they find out who he is. I suppose I'd feel the same way if Dad was famous. Mitzi looked at my baseball cards. That used to be Grandpa, she said when she spotted Big. What do you mean, used to be, I asked. He's still your Grandpa, isn't he? Yes, but he's different now. He has more fat. He has probably, he was probably a lot younger when they took this picture, I said, holding up the, his card. She nodded. Where's Fudge? He's playing, he's planting a garden with his babysitter. Where's the garden? Behind the house. Will you take me? I started to tell her to go by herself. After all, she'd walked all the way to our house on her own, but she looked at me with those big eyes. Sometimes monsters live behind houses, she said, and I didn't bring my monster spray. Monster spray, I asked. Grandma makes it for me. It's a secret formula. When you spray the monsters, they melt. Sounds like an interesting product. Dad would have a field day with it, I thought. He's in advertising. Commercials are his business. I can see it now. Mitzi's Monster Spray, made from a grandmother's secret formula. Spray twice a day and melt your monsters away. Mitzi held out her hand. Will you walk me around the house? How could I refuse? I walked her to the backyard where Sheila and Fudge were hard at work. They'd hardly dug out a plot of land. Now they were lining up rows of pink rocks from the beach. You're planting rocks, I asked. Yes, Fudge said. Rocks don't need sun or water. They don't get slugs. Animals can't eat them. And they never die. I looked at Sheila. It was his idea, she said. It was my idea, Fudge repeated. I like this garden, Mitzi said. She got down on her hands and knees to help. Mom and Dad are going to be surprised when they see your garden, I told Fudge. I know, he said. They're going to be surprised you dug up this much grass to plant rocks, especially since this backyard doesn't belong to us. Who does it belong to, Fudge asked. The people who own this house, I told him. So, he said, the people who own this house will be happy when they see my garden. Maybe, I told him, or maybe they'll say, who dug up our backyard? Really, Peter, Sheila said, you're such a worrier. Yeah, Pete, Fudge said, you worry too much. I don't worry, I told them, I think ahead. When the rocks were all planted, six rows of them with ten in each row, Mitzi scooped up a handful of dirt. Now let's make a mud pie. Mud pie, Fudge said. That's what they have for dessert at Tico Taco. Right, Pete? It's not made of mud, I told him. Then why do they call it mud pie, he asked. Because it looks like mud, I explained. Yum, mud pie, Mitzi said, licking the dirt off her fingers. Spit that out right now, Sheila told her. That's full of bacteria. Yum, bacteria. Mitzi said, I love bacteria. Don't you, Fudge? Bacteria's my favorite, Fudge said. Then he looked up at me. What's bacteria, Pete? It's like germs, I told him. Yum, germs, Mitzi said. Germs are really tasty. Cooties are tasty too, Fudge said, and slugs. Slugs are fat and juicy. You two are disgusting, Sheila said. 
Germy, germy, germs, and sluggy, sluggy, slugs, Mitzi sang. Yummy, yummy, down my tummy. Fudge held his arms straight out to his sides and began to twirl. Mitzi caught beat him. They twirled around and around faster and faster until they got so dizzy they fell to the ground, screaming and laughing. Then they started all over again. Stop that, Sheila shouted. We can't, Fudge yelled, twirling and whirling. It's Fudge-a-mania, Mitzi shrieked. Once you get it, you can never stop. I'm going to count to three, Sheila shouted. But Sheila's threats didn't bother them. You better watch out, Fudge sang, because it's catching. He twirled over to me and swatted my behind. Now you've got it, Pete. You've got Fudgemania too. I started twirling, slowly at first, then faster and faster until everything was a blur. I twirled over to Sheila and smacked her on the back. Look out, Sheila, you just caught it from me. I didn't catch anything from you, Sheila shouted. I will never catch anything from you. The door to the house slammed and out marched Libby. She was wearing her Snoopy t-shirt. It's so big it hangs down to her knees. She stomped across the yard. Just what exactly is going on here, she asked. She didn't wait for an answer. And how am I supposed to sleep with this racket? Sleep? Mitzi asked. Now? Yes, now, Libby said. It's only 10 o'clock in the morning. You sleep until 10 o'clock in the morning? Mitzi said like she couldn't believe it. Libby put her hands on her hips and glared. I try. But morning is the best time to play, Mitzi said. Who is this kid? Libby asked Sheila. Mitzi Atful, Sheila said, a neighbor. I'm five, Mitzi told her, and I walked here all by myself. I didn't need anyone to show me the way. I'll tell you what you need, Libby began. But Mitzi didn't wait to hear what Libby had to say. She raced off shouting, It's fudge mania Fudge followed Mitzi. Sheila chased both of them. You're all maniacs, Libby shouted. fudge maniacs I added. Either Libby didn't get my joke or she decided to ignore it because she said, This is all your fault, Peter. Chaos follows you and your family. Chaos, I said. I don't believe I know him. That got Libby really mad. Chaos, she yelled. A state of utter confusion or disorder. Then she stomped back to the house and went inside, letting the screen door slam behind her. I couldn't help laughing. When mom and dad saw Fudge's garden, I expected them to really let him have it. They've always taught us to respect other people's property. But when Fudge explained his reason for planting rocks, Mom said, That's very good thinking. A good babysitter encourages creative thinking, Sheila said. But doesn't this show a lack of respect for other people's property, I asked? Well, Mom said, it would have been better if Fudge had checked with us before he started. But his idea was so well thought out. Rocks don't need sun or water. Animals can't eat them. Yeah, 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 I said. I've heard all about it. Grandma wandered across the yard with Buzzy Sr. She took one look at Fudge's garden and said, Isn't my grandson an original Buzzy? Actually, it was mostly my idea, Sheila said. That's not what you said this morning, I shouted at Sheila. This morning you said it was his idea. Just shut your face for once, Peter Hatcher, she shouted back. Who's going to make me, I yelled. Children, Grandma said. Let's be kind. Kind is a word your grandson doesn't know, Muriel, Sheila shouted. He knows it, Grandma said, but sometimes he forgets what it means. And she doesn't, I asked. Sometimes she forgets too, Grandma admitted. I don't see why you two can't get along as well as your dogs, Buzzy Sr. said. I looked toward the house. Turtle and Jake were playing together. You'd think Turtle would show more loyalty. You'd think he under he'd understand about Sheila and me. Tootsie grabbed my leg. Up, P, up! Not now, I said. Now, now, now! 
but I wasn't in the mood for baby tricks, so I shook her off and she fell over on her backside. It took a few seconds for her to react. Then she scrunched up her face. Her mouth started twitching. Her breath came fast. She made her little hands into a fist, shut her eyes tight, and opened her mouth. Once she got going, you could hear her a mile away. What happened, Tootsie Pie? Dad asked as he lifted her up into his arms. Tootsie kept screaming and Mom looked at me. Was that necessary, Peter? Was what necessary, I asked. Mom just shook her head. You see how much trouble you caused for everyone? Sheila shouted at me. How come I'm getting blamed for this, I thought. All I did was ask one simple question. Fudge held up his arms to Mom. Up, he said. Up, up, up. You want to play baby, Mom asked. Goo goo gaga, Fudge said, jumping into Mom's arms. You're getting heavy, Mom said, planting a kiss on his head. But not too heavy for Mommy, right? I shook my head, then turned away and watched Dad galloping around the yard with Tootsie on his shoulders. In a minute, Tootsie was laughing, and I remember when Dad carried Fudge that way, and there's a photo of me on his shoulders, too. I'm laughing really hard and grabbing Dad's hair. He had a lot more to grab. Go, horsey! Tootsie called as Dad galloped in the other direction. Being a baby is so easy, I thought, riding around on your Dad's shoulders, knowing he'd never let you fall, and doing and saying whatever you please without worrying about what the other guy will think. Grandma put her arm around my shoulder. It's not easy being the firstborn, is it? I looked at her and smiled. She knew exactly what I was feeling. All right, my friends, that was chapters seven and eight. Hope you enjoyed. Bye.